You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BNH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the BNH Photography Podcast. Most photographers prefer cameras they can use right out of the box. Jeffrey Berliner, the executive director of the Penumbra Foundation and the Center for Alternative Photography here in Manhattan, is not one of those people. Jeff's been building what are commonly referred to as Franken cameras and they are essentially functional camera mashups using components from various cameras, some of them going back 100 years or more. Best part, Jeff actually uses these unique cameras for alternative process portraiture and landscapes. This is also Jeff's second appearance on our show as a guest. One more appearance and you get a free T-shirt. Oh, can't okay. wait, can't wait. Yeah, we did a laundry <laughs> last night. I think we have a clean one in your size. I'll bring it in for you next week. Um, also joining us today is the man who makes Jeff's dreams come true, Frank. <laughs> Frank Rubio, <laughs> also known as the camera doctor. Frank is a master technician and repair person. Frank worked as the in-house repair whiz at Lens and Repro here in Manhattan for 15 years. Before that, Frank was a photographer and a repairman for the Army, which is where he received his photographic training. About two years ago, I had a rare wide-angle lens that needs some serious attention. The technicians at the factory where it was made could not help me. They didn't even have the parts. I brought it to Frank, and two weeks later, I was out shooting with it. The man knows his stuff. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Jeff, Frank, thanks for inviting us over to your shop today. Thank yeah. you, Alan. Thank Great you. Great space, right? This is good. We're actually in, a, in the middle of a dark room surrounded by alternative processing uh, 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 tools and techniques, uh, things to hold heads still when doing long exposures during portraits, and about 20 view cameras, and as well as a table full of Franken cameras, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And I think it's also worth mentioning, we were setting up here this morning, we un opened up an old uh, uh, folding table that is covered with chemical stains. <laughs> and being a true photographer, Jeff stopped what he's doing, took out his phone and started doing close-ups of the splash. <laughs> it looks so cool. And Alan just rubbed his face up Little. against it. Right? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was, yeah, I was just bonding with the stuff. It was just Jackson <laughs> Pollock type thing. You got to talk about the, 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 the smell, the, yeah. the odor that, that, yes. that's, that's, that's yeah. here as well. You we know, are wearing hazmat suits here today. <laughs> yeah, it's like pickling, pickling juice. <laughs> Jeff, when did you start making these Franken monster cameras? Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I've been a photographer. I, I didn't study photography. I studied religion and philosophy. But um, I always had a camera. Uh, my father, who uh, was an art, uh, an artist and an art teacher, high school of art and design in New York City, um, and my grandfather was a photographer, photo retoucher for the New York Times. He went to Cooper Union. Uh, anyway, so you know. All my life, I've had uh, cameras. My father gave me a Kodak Instamatic, and I, I still have it. In fact, when he passed away, I went through his stuff, and there it was with the little manual wrapped around it really? um, <laughs> that he put aside <laughs> for me uh, that I found. And my father always had Leicas and Rollies and things like that, and he was always dropping them. And breaking. <laughs> I couldn't touch them and hold them, but he can break them as much as he wanted. Um, and he would you know, bring me to all these camera stores, Lens and Repro, um, Photo Care, um, you know, uh, Harvey Zucker, Harvey Zucker, sure. photographer's place, um, Ken Hansen, you name it. I mean, like a Saturday with my dad was like schlepping around or a Sunday, depending on uh, the store, uh, because a lot of the stores weren't open on a Saturday. Um, well, you know, hanging out, looking at cameras, you know, and, um, and also going, getting film process, all this sort of stuff. And it was just in my blood. So I had, um, my first camera was the, uh, the Instamatic, and then I had, a, I think I had a Canon, um, F, the original F Canon, and then I had a Pentax K1000, and then when I was in graduate school, I had enough money, I was a teaching fellow, I earned enough money so I could buy a Leica, but I didn't have that much money, so um, I bought a CL, mm -hmm. and then that sort of, sort of started um, the ball rolling where I just wanted to get more into Leica, and then I wanted to get into larger formats and bigger negatives, and then larger formats, 4x5, you know, so I got into Rollies, and I got into 4x5, Linhoff's. And I just, you know, I'm a dog with a bone. It just keeps on going and going. And then I go to the flea market, find a huge brass lens. And then, well, what was that used for? Well, I found that it was used for 19th century photography, that I wanted to learn about that. So the idea is just, you know, being curious and 
getting old equipment and then wanting it to work and then trying to fix it myself. And that's where Frank comes in. So I would, you know, buy these old cameras <laughs> and I would try to repair them and, of course, break them even worse. And then I would bring them to uh, Lens and Repro and, and Jeffrey Kay, who was incredibly and Steve, uh, incredibly generous, would, would let me go and speak to Frank. Not many people were allowed to go back at Lens and Repro and see Frank. And I would show it to Frank. And <laughs> he'd show up at my counter there. Yeah. And I'd have his camera. <laughs> and Frank would go, oh, no. We'd start the discussion. He says, <laughs> right. can, can you fix this? I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but Frank, what, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, how'd you, how was it learning photography and repair in the Army? Uh, well, I always had a love for uh, photography. I guess it, it, it started with, uh, you know, just, just like you, Jeffrey, uh, my grandfather. And he had uh, what I thought was a really interesting camera. It happened to be a, a, a Rolly, a twin lens reflex. And uh, it just captured my eye. It just looked so different than anything else. And, and, and I, always, uh, I always saw it. I saw him shooting with it. He was also a painter. So, you know, he was just an artist in his, his own right. Uh, I didn't know that. I used to see him doing that all the time. It wasn't until I was uh, uh, probably in junior high school or something like that that uh, I wanted to pursue photography and found out that he had a whole darkroom set up as well. So, uh, you, know, ev- you know, eventually I acquired all that stuff from him and, and there went the whole uh, adventure of photography and, uh, and all. I uh, went into the military and uh, I chose what I wanted to do in the military. I just didn't sign up. I knew that you could be a photographer in the military. Uh, so I, I pursued that uh, and uh, first went to the Air Force, told me no such thing. <laughs> I said, uh. it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Found out the school was actually at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so I, I, I happened to have, uh, was doing, uh, you know, working as a photographer, doing weddings like a lot of people kind of do and start in high school. And uh, the Army recruiters happened to be, uh, you know, my clients at the time and I went to them and I say, hey, listen, I, I know I can be a photographer in the military and give me the real deal. So uh, I, luckily knowing people and uh, knowing some Army recruiters, I was able to get in there. And, and actually photography wasn't available. The slots were all taken. My next choice was uh, a camera technician. And I, again, I had a love for, uh, you know, tearing things apart, seeing how things work, the mechanisms, that, that whole thing. And I'm fascinated with that. So it was right down my alley. And the, the classes were, were they taught by Army folks or did you, they send you out to a school? Uh, the uh, school was uh, at the time was at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I was the only Army in my class. Uh, the rest were all Marines. Uh, no Navy at the, in, that, in my class at that time. But uh, all branches were, went, went to school together. Uh, and it's a very intense uh, course. It, it, it was, I believe, about eight months, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, of, of training. Wait, you, know, you, you mentioned early on uh, High School of Art and Design. When I was there, the curriculum was based on the Navy photographic training courses, which were incredibly complex and detailed. Oh, yeah, uh, and absolutely. Not messing around. If you, if you can get a military training on camera photography and repair... It's thorough. I don't know what it's like today, but well, if you get your hands on any of the old manuals, the, you know the manuals, the service manuals. I they, they're that's another thing. I, I you know people find that I don't I don't read necessarily read books or novels or things, but what I end up reading are, are manuals. You know, they're 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 my <laughs> go to. You did know? they teach you on one camera system, or did you have to learn a range? You were trained depending on what the government contracted to buy at the time. So you eventually learned on many different things. You became a jack of all trades when it came to the cameras because again, it was whatever the government, you know, agreed to buy or purchase for, you know, during that time. So it was anywhere from Hasselblads and, you know, Graflexes and Bronicas and Pentexes, just just the whole oh, gamut of, of things, to, you know. Uh, a lot of, believe it or not, even in the 80s, a uh, lot of the Army were still using uh, uh, speed graphics, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, 4 by 5 And, you know, it, it, people don't realize it. Yeah, they were still, that's why you find a lot of uh, kits these days uh, in really beautiful shape because uh, you you'll find them at, you know. At auctions, yeah. <laughs> any reconnaissance cameras? Did you work on any of those cameras that were up in the air? Uh, I, they, uh, I did work on a few of those. There was a whole separate. Usually, that was dealt by the Air Force. 
you know, they did break it up. Well, wait a second, the Air Force doesn't have photography, right? Man, right? That's, did you yeah, say that's that what they, on? That's what they told me. They just wanted me to, you know, they just wanted their quota for name. me to sign yeah, up. They, yeah, didn't, yeah. they didn't expect this young kid to come in yeah. and, and actually know what he was talking about, do the research, you know. So <laughs> something I'm curious about before we start talking, because we're going to be talking about some bizarre cameras here today. From your perspective, Frank, most photographers, I would say probably 95% of the photographers out there, they know how to use their camera, they're great taking pictures, they have no idea what's going on under the hood. You do. Does that affect how you approach photography at all, knowing that the mechanics and all of the theory and all of the stuff that goes on underneath the skin of the camera? I'm sure it does. You know, I'm, I know it does. Well, you know, I don't probably think about it now because it's so second nature for me. Uh, but, but it's, it's there in the it's, background. It, it, it is there. You know, I do think about it, for instance, on uh, doing a location job, what's going to be more, uh, you know, uh, better to take, for instance, mechanically versus you know, electronically. I mean, the, you know, at a point when I did my own uh, um, uh, little photo adventure in, in Moab, uh, a few years back, that's when the phase one system, digital cameras coming out, and I you know, it was like, I didn't want to rely on battery power, I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere, right, right. electronics and all this, you know, so uh, basically that's when I discovered by putting the, the, the phase one back with my Hasselblad V system, and the results out of that were just incredible. And everybody saw my images, and what did he do? You know, I, I just processed the image digitally, you know, but nothing more than that. And they realized that it was the combination of that, those lenses mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the digital buy, uh, back, bringing those two together, we got better results than everything being so optimized just for digital. Interesting. So yeah. what's your first, the first camera you guys built together? Is, is, but would it be fair to say that Jeff, you're Dr. Frankenstein and uh, Frank, you're Igor? I mean, um, I think, you know, just to get to that, back to that point. We'll cut that out, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I, I, well, I think um, I'm both, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm both, too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm mixed. You know, I think we, we go back and forth. It's because, just our mad minds of, of trying to create things. Yeah, so, you and, know. I, we, and we do go back and forth. I mean, Frank will come and say, Jeff, what do you think of this, you know, from time to time. And I'll, I'm more often coming in and saying, you know, I need to do this. How do I need to do it? And I almost feel like, well, I should be working, you know, for Frank, you know, a little by little. <laughs> learning more so you skills. guys really do collaborate. This is this is really oh, yeah. a 50-50 oh, thing here. Every day. Okay. Every day we're, yeah. we're going back and forth, you know, asking questions or things. I mean, Jeffrey is extremely knowledgeable and, and an expert in lenses, where that's that's something I don't necessarily have that knowledge or expertise in in, in the optics part. What he now, knows about lenses frightens me. It, yeah, it it's, really does. It's, yeah, I, me you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, mechanically, putting them all together you know that's where he comes to me and says is this supposed to go this way or that way and stuff and i said no it goes this way that way <laughs> so yeah. you know and, you know yeah. i think you no know, necessity is really the mother of invention i think photography is problem solving and i think it starts with um you have a project and how you can do it it could be low light or it could be wet plate it could be alternative process it could be film or it could be digital and then you have to say to yourself well how am i going to accomplish that and then if you have enough knowledge and it gets to the mechanical knowledge that frank has or the mechanical knowledge that I have, but I can't always figure out how to get these things together, um, will bring you to the solution. And that whole process of figuring it out is, a, is what I really love. So with wet plate, which is ASA-1, you know, speed is very important. Um, and then if I'm shooting children in the studio and they're moving and I can't you know, clamp them in, you know, that's why I came up with the Graflex system where Frank put in a, you know, a PC switch so I can use strobe with it and a fast lens. And then, of course, infinity is an issue, so we worry about where it fits in the camera, you know, uh, and corresponding with the film plane and not having the mirror in the way. So all these things start coming into play, and you're trying to figure out how am I going to accomplish this problem. You, ju you just start taking things and just start putting them together. You take your ideas, what you might have in mind, and, you know, I mean, like this uh, Graflex we have in uh, uh, Super D we have in front of us, you know, you can see that. You know, the front is, uh, has some tape on it. You yeah. know, you do, you do things to find out. It's, you know, it's, I like it's, the, it's, it's, it's <laughs> like, you know, like any, any design of anything or research, you start prototyping something. You figure out, okay, this needs to go this way, that needs to go that way. Well, this needs to be cut down that way. Let's start know? with this graphic that's in front of us. And, Can and, you, and by the yeah. way, if you're listening to the podcast and you want to see what we're talking about, we have photographs of these cameras on our landing page. So go to the go to the, go to our page, and you'll see as you're listening, you can see what we're talking about. So this graphics that we have in front of us, this combination of 
lens and camera we have in front of us. How did uh, what was the inspiration for this? The inspiration for this is the Graflex four x five Super D. Um, and it has a graph lock back on it. Um, the earlier ones had a graph lock back, a different kind of film holder went in there. The graph lock back allows you to put um, Polaroid uh, backs on it, regular modern film holders. Well, contemporary. Contemporary, um, r- contemporary roll film backs. And I've been using these cameras you know, for many years for film and for Polaroid and things like that, but I wanted to start using them in the Tintype studio. And the Tintype studio has uh, particular needs, um, especially since uh, we started using strobe. And the strobe came about because we wanted to photograph children and, and pets. So you can't put a pet in, in a headrest. You know, they don't, want, <laughs> they don't want to stay still. <laughs> so the idea was to be able to focus with the subject. So I got the idea of, and I knew that the and we also want to shoot larger formats. So, um, so the idea was to, and I also have a 5x7 like that as well that I modified. Um, there is an 8x10 graph like I'm trying to track it down. <laughs> I know where it is, it won't tell me. But I've the only idea, seen pictures. Yeah. <laughs> So the idea is to be able to handhold, have a single end reflex that so you can focus with your subject and then hit the, the shutter and fire the strobe. Um, and the camera that already existed for that was the four by, the only one is the 4x5 Super D. And the reason why the Super D is the single end reflex so you can focus, you can, you know, some people could probably use a speed graphic, which has a rangefinder, but that has a really small lens board. So the idea behind this was to be able to put very large, fast lenses um, because you're limited, the strobe is only so powerful. I mean, I'm, I'm maxing out at 4,800 watt cycles. And I want to be able to just hit that shutter and capture that image um, with a very fast lens. So this uh, Graflex allows me to uh, put a fast lens on it. So the front has been modified um, so that we can um, put longer lenses for nice perspective on the front standard. We carved it out and we can swap out lenses. I actually even also made a adjustable iris uh, universal clamp so we can swap out lenses on that that goes in the front of this camera. Um, you can also put the, the standard lens um, uh, on the inside. Um, but the idea is to put a long, a long fast lens. This has a Petzl portrait lens, 9-inch F4, which is sort of the magic number for strobe. Um, and then this camera has built-in strobe capability. It has a bi-post strobe connection. What happened with this camera, we were putting so much ridiculous amount of electricity through it that I think we burnt out <laughs> That bi tube, <laughs> uh, that bi post, um, and Frank actually replaced that bi post a couple of times. Um, have. So, um, so then I said, "Well, what's the solution to that? Because I can't rely on that. If you're doing a job or or, or if you're shooting in the studio, you have to be and you're working with kids. You have to have that that strobe working." So Frank said, "Oh, I'll put a PC switch in that." I'm like, "Oh, what's that? Oh, well, that's a little switch you put in there, and he put a little connector for um, for for a PC um, cord." And there's a little switch on the inside, so when the mirror pops up, it hits, uh, it, it pops up and hits the switch and fires the strobe. And that's when that no. little clown pops up the top. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, was yeah. that were you basing that on something you'd seen already, or that well, was totally any uh, you know any shutter mechanism? It's 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 based on an open and close system. Just it's, so so it's uh, even even on 35 millimeter cameras, the, it's it's all the the sink is attached to the shutter in some some manner, some kind of way. Uh, so that it gets proper uh, sync. Uh, in in this case, uh, you know, I'm able to do it uh, by uh, installing a micro switch and wiring a, a, a standard PC sync on the side. Um, the the key is uh, you do have to uh, uh, operate this in the open position when you're you know fully open because of the size of the shutter. And then the mirror is in the down position, which is preventing the plate or the film from being exposed. So the mirror, you know, the mirror pops up, the light comes in, the strobe hits, and then the shutter comes down and you have your exposure. What would be one of the more adventurous cameras you guys cobbled together? Hmm. I don't know. That's a good this is a, this is a good one. I mean, he worked on the on the home portrait um, uh, for me, which is a 5x7 camera. He put a PC switch on that, and he modified the back. So that's an interesting camera. Because well, let's bring, that can you bring that over here? Sure. Let's talk about that. So what's interesting about the home portrait is that um, unlike the other, many other Graflex cameras, especially SLRs. Oh, this is the one I put the spring back on for you. Right. So tell us about it, like so, camera and then lens. Well, Frank can, Frank can talk yeah, about Frank that. Uh, this, uh, this one Jeffrey brought to me. He wanted to make it uh, you know, easier to use, of course, and with uh, modern uh, film backs and such. So he uh, actually that's, uh, which, what back is that from, the Jeff? Cambo. Cambo. 
And I, and I chose that because um, one of the issues with, with these cameras is that um, the film plane um, in, uh, relative to the ground glass on the top, the uh, viewing glass, uh, the reflex uh, ground glass, um, is important, and if you have a, a ground glass, this is where you know you're sort of you know envisioning and thinking about these things. Um, is that there's only so much distance you can move that ground glass up. So the further out you bring your 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 film back, you know, the higher up the ground glass has to go right. to correspond oh, to the correspond film plane. To sure, yeah. Right. So I had to find a uh, a ground glass uh, modern back that had a very short, narrow profile, so that I can keep it as close to the back of the body as possible. So that gave Frank. Uh, the right amount of distance um, uh, or leeway uh, to find the right focus for the ground glass um, in in relation to the film back. So yeah, the, 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 that would allow the camera to still close up and you know be portable without. Right, right. You know, right, I mean, okay. you know, you could you could always uh, put other backs on there, but then I would have to put modify the the screen, you know, the focusing screen itself. And then in that case, it would not close. So, and that would also sacrifice your close focusing. Right, distance. you know, every, every 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 all those things come into play. Yeah, one yeah, yeah. one okay. thing's going to affect another, and that'll affect this and that, and that's where you kind of you know you know what may work in your mind in your head necessarily may not work physically, and that's where we start bringing everything together, and then we find out exactly where the common ground is, where right. the, where the happy medium right. is, and yeah, exactly. And then I try. There's to a lot of happy mediums. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of compromises. But then what I in, in knowing and understanding that's why mechanics is very important. In knowing and understanding um, these these aspects of photography and re, in relational aspects, it's very important that before you start, you know, finding the right thing because I could have just found any ground glass back, um, and Frank would say, "Oh, that's not going to work," you know. <laughs> So what I, I, yeah, I would. I already been down that. I would road. have been that road. <laughs> so I already think ahead of time and know that that you know, the the distance is very important. So I found the narrowest one I can find, which was a uh, you know a Cambo uh, five by seven, which uh, worked very Springback, well. Which worked, it worked really well. It worked really well. Do you have a date on this camera? More like camera probably about nineteen ten. You know, and the thing about the home portrait, the reason I chose home portrait five by seven is it's the only. A five by seven Graflex that has a rotating back, so I have the um, horizontal or landscape um, orientation or the portrait orientation, um, and so that was very important. And it also allows you to take um, interchangeable lenses and a large lens board because a lot of the lenses that I use um, are fast, and you need to be able to mount them. Um, another aspect of this camera: this camera um, was uh, doesn't have a shutter in it, um, and the reason I chose that camera, I actually sent that camera. Um, to be repaired for the shutter by a guy named Fred Lustig, who passed away. He was a uh, Graflex repairman. Um, he worked for Graflex, and then when Graflex went out of business, he purchased all their parts, and he actually made shutters for these things, um, and he couldn't repair it because it had been dropped, so the shutter wouldn't, wouldn't he put a new shutter in it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't um, fire correctly. So um, he sent it back without the shutter, and since I don't need a shutter for, um, for wet plate, I just basically... Um, Set it up with a with a PC switch, which uh, Frank uh, mounted to it. I put a Petzl portrait lens. I was uh, going to ask, what's the story with the lens? It's a um, it's a Peerless. Um, I forget the name of that. Um, it's an American Scoville. It's a Scoville Peerless. It's an American, um, you know, portrait lens from probably the 1860s. Okay. I would say. So the lens predates the camera. Yeah, and that's the kind of lens that would have been used on a um, you know wet plate camera of the period. Uh, and because, um, you know, wet plate or uh, collodion, you know, tin type photography is so slow, ASA-1, um, you don't need a shutter. You just need to, you know, in order to stop the light, you, you hit the strobe, which is the dominant light source, uh, and then you just bring the mirror back down. And the mirror acts like the light trap. Um, not all single lens reflex cameras have this. I mean, Graflex is one of the only ones where the mirror covers the entire film plane. Many other reflex cameras, the mirror doesn't cover completely. So it's smaller, it actually gives you a narrower profile because of that, but it also means that, you know, if the shutter were up and the mirror were down, light is still getting through. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to think about those things um, when you decide what camera uh, you're going to choose for these types of things. The, the purpose for this modification was then to use it again in 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 the Tintype studio? Yes, And exactly. so you had the lens that you wanted to use to kind of yeah. replicate the era. And you built the camera, or you modified the camera to fix that. Yeah, to, and I have to, to modify that. it even more because you know that lens is very heavy. Aluminum lenses, uh, many uh, the Cook lenses, a Cook lens I'm going to put on there that had an aluminum barrel. Um, there's also a, uh, a Meyer Trioplan. There were 
a lot of, there were a lot of lenses that used aluminum around that period, um, 1910. They used magnesium, which actually was not very stable, so it started cracking, so they started using aluminum. And the idea was for a handheld photographer, they wanted to have as light mm -hmm. um, a lens as possible. And are they easy to find? I mean, well, they're not easy to find, but how hard are they to find? They're pretty hard at this point, you know. Um, things have been really fished out mm -hmm. of the ocean of lenses. Um, Could you tell our listeners how many pets of the lenses you own? Well, I mean, I don't know how many pet flows. I probably own about 1,500 to 2,000 lenses. Now you know why there are no left in the They're market. all in the ocean. Yeah, they're all in my ocean. They're all in my ocean. <laughs> Jeffrey owns them all. He's the well, one you know, brothers of pet yeah. lenses. <laughs> but keep in mind that when I was collecting, you know, they were throwing them away. People yeah, you could buy care. them by the pound yeah. back then. Yeah. And I yeah. did. I, you know, I didn't know what they were. I wanted to, I mean, curiosity. I didn't know what they were. I wanted to find out. I wanted to see how they rendered uh, images and light. Uh, and I think, you know, curiosity, it wasn't a, you know, for you know, maybe people say, oh, you're a hoarder. Well, you know, I guess I am, but um, <laughs> I'm, very, very, I'm a very curious hoarder and I'm working on a book on them, but, and, but also photographic equipment. And the thing is when you have every different lens and you know the focal length, you know what they do when you have a project, if it's a large format, you have it, you know, and you know, and if you want a particular perspective, you have it. If you want a particular look, coded, not coded, you know, flat field, curved field, um, before you, you break the rules, it. know the rules, and you know Ex all the rules. I know all the rules, <laughs> and I know how to break them. Too. So, but, what, but what's interesting about those old lenses, though, I mean, it's the glass itself, too. You can have uh, several of the same lenses, and each one of them can actually end up giving you a different A different look. signature and different look. Different Absolutely. Signature. That's, That's correct. A good, Absolutely. Good, a good way to put it. It's a good, yeah, signature. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, there's uh, in the, it happened quite a bit with the, the Pentec lenses. Yeah. You know, I worked with a lot of Pentec lenses, and uh, and I don't think I saw one of them that gave that that same bouquet in the in that you know in there. They were, everything was different. Some was more pronounced. Some was very subtle. So you know, some was very creamy. If you know, you know just, what you're looking at, choosing a lot of these older lenses, and I don't think you could say this about modern lenses. No, you can't. But with older classic lenses like this that go back decades or a hundred years. It's not much different than a musician picking up a similarly aged violin Absolutely. or instrument where they each have their own personalities and notes. And if you understand what you're listening to, or in this case, looking at, you can actually choose a lens to. Uh, oh, absolutely! It's, they're it's like, like paintbrushes, or paintbrushes, exactly. Right. Uh, but even that, on the violin um, analogy, you know, even bows. I knew a bow maker um, who worked with, um, you know, very, very renowned uh, violinists, and they each had a different feel. They had a different springiness to it, yeah. a different weight to them. Then they would be modified to get back to the Pentac thing. You know, they were made during the war. They were very fast. A lot of people liked them because they're they're, they're f two point nine for an eight inch lens, which is pretty fast for that mm -hmm. kind of a large format lens. And it gave wonderful bokeh, which is you know the the quality of the out of focus area um, during the Second World War. These were re reconnaissance lenses, Air Ministry. They were made by Downmeyer and Ross, and um, they made them so quickly. Um, and the quality wasn't great. They just wanted to get them on the airplanes. So you don't know who was grinding them. A lot of them were ground by hand, and they just wanted to get So each one had a different signature. And you're not going to know how they look. Sometimes you like it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes they're flat. Sometimes they're contrasty. Um, and that's the reason for lenses like that. But, you know, for Petzl portrait lenses, um, they were all hand ground, and that had a, uh, an effect on the image quality. But they all age a little differently. Uh -huh, you, know, yeah. you know, interesting, the, 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 the coding on lenses came about because there were uh, old photography, say, around the turn of the century, who were using some of these old Petzl portrait lenses. And because of the metals in the glass, they would develop this oxidation on the surface, like a blooming, it was called. And it was discovered mm -hmm. that that blooming was giving them more contrast. It was actually concentrating, giving higher resolution of the light passing through the glass. And they ended up loving those lenses more. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the lens company discovered that that oxidation um, uh, could be used. If they can recreate that oxidation to create coating, um, it would give you higher contrast. Of course, that right. corresponded with color photography, uh, which requires um, much more concentration of light. The spectrum falls into focus right. in a tighter band. But it also, it's also cutting down flare, and it's giving yeah, you yeah, much yeah, more yeah, saturation yeah. and concentration mm -hmm. of light. So, so, Frank, so I'm sorry. That, that old um, adage that uh, they don't make them like they used to, is it, uh, would you say that's pretty that's, accurate? That's, that's very true. And I, can I, you put like a date even on, on when you start, and I'm not talking about film to digital, but uh, even in, in the film era when, when you can start to see I think the things. big change in the manufacturing and, you know, of the, the uh, cameras, the qualities really started changing probably in the 70s, the early 70s. You know, then when we started developing, you know, uh, plastic, you know, and 
uh, the, the space age plastics, all the different types of plastics and in making it, and, and everything was being made out of plastic and still to this day. And that's what I really hate as a technician. It just doesn't hold up to that. I mean, you know, uh, going back to talking about the lenses, uh, there's a, it, uh, as a young technician, I, I learned several times not to clean a lens of a, cli of a customer's or a client's because they would come in with their lens and, and, you know, of course, as a technician, I'd clean it up, make everything nice and pretty again. But some of these 100-year-old lenses, they shot them exactly the way they were, the way they were no, 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 with no. the dirt and the grime and the cr crud that was all over it because that was giving them that look that they were looking for. Right. <laughs> as soon as I cleaned that up, it wasn't there anymore. It was gone. So, you know, I learned that quick. I never clean these glasses. Yeah. The ones I wear. Uh, no, no. No, it's a amazing. Lot of, a lot of things see. you don't clean. No, 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 talk about that. <laughs> anything what you don't <laughs> see is not the key, right? It's what you don't want to see, I guess. <laughs> so maybe we should bring over another camera. And, uh, <laughs> but right, his, yeah. this is a completely different one. It, is, it looks like a Roloflex. This is a, uh, a, a ROC, R O C C A. I've never yeah. heard of this. Uh, got a German lens. It's a twin lens. Looks like a Yashica Matter Roli, but it's not. What could we tell? What could you tell us about this guy? That's Sorry. a that's a um, it's a German camera, and uh, the reason I started using that, I mean, I didn't want to use the Rol Roloflex. They're very they're going up in value. It seems that um, they um, they just keep going. I mean, you know, there was a time when people were literally thinking that film was going to be gone and dead, mm -hmm. uh, and people were selling them on eBay and other places just to get rid of them. They thought, you know, I might as well get the money out of them that I can at this moment. Um, and I was kind of one of those people. And at that time I was like, I couldn't believe that you can like, you know, maybe 15 years ago, you can buy like a 2.8 F Roly or something like that, you know, for a couple of hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, everybody was, was bailing. Everybody was bailing. And it was like, it was a strange time because, you know, you had to save up for those. I and mean, you wanted one, you had to say, or a Leica, you know, and then it just seemed like the, you know, the floor fell out from under, uh, that whole market. Um, but then when I started getting into wet plate collodion photography, um, I could, and I needed a fast lens, so, you know, I didn't want to use a 3.5, this is a 2.8. Um, I also wanted to use some of these cameras for wet plate. So this camera doesn't have a huge amount of modification, but it does have a fast lens and it's a well-made camera. So what I did is I opened up the back and I painted the inside with something called spar urethane, which is a very hard material that will allow you to take a, um, a glass plate or tin type and put it in the back and use it for wet plate collodion photography. And that's a lot of what the modifications that I do because I need to use these cameras in the tin type studio or I need to uh, use them for other types of things. And this is the kind of camera if you didn't want to bring a big a big kit out into the field, you want to have a small little uh, you know dark box and you can you can buy them now um, and bring a small kit out and get a nice and keep in mind that if you shoot a glass negative um, with this as ASA one, the resolution is amazing. You can blow up that negative very large, much larger than if it was a you know two and a quarter, two and a quarter film negative. So this gives you all kinds of possibilities. You just modify it a little bit, make a glass plate, put it in the back, do your exposure, take it out, develop it. Uh, then you can print it and do all kinds of things. So the idea is to f repurpose and find different ways to use some of these old cameras. And this camera is, you know, it's not an inexpensive camera, but it's not a two thousand dollar camera. It's maybe a couple of hundred dollars. What's the just uh, as a side uh, question? What's the latitude of uh, uh, a plate that has ISO one going for it? How much how much room do you have for exposure slob? Um, it's, it's, well, you need a lot of exposure. You need a lot of light. I mean, you'd be off by one stop, two stops, three stops. Well, you have some you have latitude in your development. I think. Okay. It, yeah, that's more your development yeah. than you do. So yeah, that's where you do your fine tuning, right there. Yeah, yeah. that's when, when, whenever I watch you guys, uh, your process, and I think I'd have to say that's probably more where you have the more latitude is where you can. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, yeah, it affects your contrast and things like that. But I think you know, um, with wet plate, it's ASA one, and you have a dynamic range of about five stops. You don't get really black black. You don't get really white white, but you get a wonderful, nice orthochromatic palette, which mm -hmm. is nice as a different look. It's a little bit of tonality. It's not true monochrome because you know, collodion does have um, a color cast. Uh, and, um, you know, for, uh, for, for, for wet plate, what's really, really important is having the right exposure, um, in relation to the right development. So, and we always, we always gauge the exposure by how fast your development is. So if you're in the 10 to 15 second range, um, 
then you've got a good exposure. And then you can, you can adjust your exposure. If somebody has darker skin, you want to give it a little more light. If they have lighter skin, you need a little less light because you want to maintain as much detail as possible. But mm -hmm. you can control that with the development. So the development, if, if it goes really fast, you want to stop that development. Um, but then you get a very contrasty uh, image. So you know it's overexposed if your development is really quick. So, you know, it's not, you know, dissimilar than film. You know, you, you know your, um, your film, you know your ASA, and you know your exposure, you know your development time. You can mess around, you can make a little more contrast, a little flatter, that sort of thing. Uh, and um, wet plate falls into that category. Now, I know you, s most of what you do has to do with traditional uh, mm -hmm. alternative processes. Have you considered or are you doing anything with digital backs on some of these older cameras? Um, you know, we have. And I think Frank has, you know, was modifying, I don't know if he finished doing it, he was modifying a Graflex um, with a digital back. And I think that's a fun thing to do. I think one of the things I do is I have my Sony Alpha 7, which is, and that's a technology that really allows you to put different kinds of lenses mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. onto the camera because they have, mo they have because of the distance between the film and people don't understand. And understanding mechanics really helps you to understand how to use these things. So the reason why it's hard to put these lenses on a Nikon a SLR or a, a, a Leica SLR or a Canon SLR is, be uh, is because of the distance from the film plane to the mount. The mirror gets in the way. Right. When you have a mirrorless camera, it's a very short distance. And all you have to do to make the lens work is get an adapter that pulls it further away. You can never bring it close enough. That's the problem with the mirror camera. But when you have a, a distance between the mount and, and the film plane the film or the plane. digital plane, then all you have to do is pull it out. And that opens up a world for every lens. And I have a lot of lenses, which I want to try, a lot of lenses that were made for a different kind of exact amount, um, Leica mount, Nikon mount, um, and then I have the cinema camera, the old petzl lenses, little projection lenses, all kinds what of things. What have you put on? What have you put on uh, A7? Oh, everything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know we, what I love? We try whether we think it's going to work or not. We yeah. try. We try to figure it out and says, well, what's this going to do? <laughs> exactly. You know? And you need to create the adapters if they don't exist. Well, I mean, it, uh, with with the technology now and and these CNC machines and, and computer technology now, uh, it's. Uh, there in in China, in China, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of third party uh, adapters that are already made. Uh, you know that sure. are that are well, you know, done that uh, that uh, are much cheaper than I can actually make here with the materials that I can get in the United States and in, in equipment. Uh, so I often tell people, uh, you know, do do some research and just find out what mount you're going to, from what mount to mount. And start there. That's going to be your most costive way to approach it. And then, then it, once they finalize what they're looking for, whatever, if it's not out there, then come to me and you know come to us here, yeah. camera doctor, oh, and and Frank we'll has see done it. Yeah. how we can figure it out and and uh, make some kind of adapter, right. you know, and machine it. Yeah. I mean, the one adapter uh, talking about it a little earlier is there are these adapters now that have built-in helicoids. Yes, um, and uh, it's a wonderful thing because I have many of these earlier lenses that have a you know a, um, a minimum focus of three feet. Um, some wonderful early you know like an early like a Sumalux you know, um, which didn't allow you to get too close for portraiture. So that really opens up the world of being able to use some of these um, longer focus uh, minimum lenses. Um, but the helicoid that lets you get closer, and that really opens up the range for a lot of these older lenses. Yeah, I have an A seven R two, and I've had. A few of the A7s already. And I usually, most of my lenses are M mount lenses from Voigtlander or Leica. Sure. And I have the VME adapter from right. Boyd, which has a four millimeter right. helicoid. All of my lenses focus far closer than they yes. would on the camera they were intended for. Right. And that's yeah. one of the things I love about yeah. it. Right. And again, like we, when we first started, when I told you the, the short story about going out to Moab and, and discovering the, the, the phase one back to use at the V system mm -hmm. and using all. And one of my favorite lenses was to use was their 30 millimeter uh, fisheye lens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the the images that I got from that were just amazing. You know, I was just I was just excited. I thought I'd discovered something all you know new. And it was just a matter of bringing the two technologies together. You know, the quality of those those old lenses uh, to to that modern technology of capturing it captured so much more that I didn't expect to catch. Uh, you know. And it had nothing to do with sharpness. You know, it, um, exactly. Nothing to do with exactly. well, sharpness. Sharp is another issue. I just wanted to bring up, just to get to this idea of the digital back, is that there are a couple of photographers that I like, a guy named Andrew Moore, who shoots digitally, and he's done some stitching. So he used it on a view camera, and he had other kinds of camera where he would, you know, 
because of that chip is only six four five six right by four point five centimeters. If you wanted to capture an image, you would um, and that have everything on that one chip. You can you know put it on it your, your adapter. You can put it on the back of your view camera, and then you can move that that digital back and take you know several images. And then stitch them. And then stitch them together. Another guy that does that, uh, does amazing work, is a guy named Jeff Liao, um, who uh, uses um, you know sort of old and new technology um, with these digital backs and view cameras. What do we have here? So this is a, uh, a stereo, uh, it's basically, um, it's called a stereographic. It's a, um, uh, I like Graflex, it's a thing you can tell. <laughs> yes, Jer- Jeffrey ha- has, uh, loves his stereo. I love stereo. He's got them in just about all formats, I think. I, I love every <laughs> format. I love I, I love being confronted with something that I think is impossible and then trying to achieve it. Um, I love stereo photography. It's a form of um, encounter to me. You take a especially stereo portraiture. I love portraiture because I love making images of people. When you make a stereo image of somebody, um, you really feel like you're confronting them and seeing them. You know, it's this you know, for me, it's as close to reality. It's still clearly an abstraction. So I've modified several stereo cameras. And this is a stereographic. It's a 5 by 7 camera with a focal plane shutter. It's like a speed graphic with two lenses. And I have these two stereo Petzl lenses that are from the 18, I would say the 1850s. The name of the photographer is engraved on oh, the lenses of oh, the match. Great. But these lenses were never meant to go together. They or were. Originally. The, yes. match, the match set. They oh, were yeah. match set. I, oh, okay. And I bought them... Um, from a from from a camera dealer, and I looked up the photographer, and it looked. It turns out he had a studio. His name was C J Fox. He had a studio. He was a Daguerrean, and a, a wet plate clothing photographer. He had a, a, a studio down on the Bowery. Correct. Uh, uh, we uh, I, well, this board. That, that's probably a board that uh, that Jeffrey made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But usually he'll come up with an idea, and then we'll come up with a uh, lens board, and we'll cut it to you know to size it up, and find out what the proper distance is between. Because that's important as well, the space between the lenses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that mm-hmm. people, you know, you can't just have them right, butt up there, right up and next to each other. Right. They have to be. Yeah, and Frank you have to find those, all find these things. all that stuff. Right. Yeah, he right. knows. He has incredible experience. What with, kind of camera? What camera do you think it was on originally? It was probably on a camera not that um, different from this one. It was probably a landscape uh, type camera, but these are portrait lenses, so mm-hmm. um, it was most likely used as a, a stereo portrait um, a ca- a camera. And the camera itself? It could have been an Anthony or a Scoville, a, a uh-huh. stereo camera uh, of the period that would have a septum in the middle. Mm-hmm. What's wonderful about this camera is that in order to, to make sure that the light is divided correctly between the two images, you have to have um, a, a barrier or it's called a septum. This, what's wonderful about this camera is that it has a, um, it's like a, it's, a, it's like a, a movable, it's like a, what are those things? It's an blinds. expandable. It's an expandable. It it's a, it's it's a, a spring loaded. that will, yeah, that will move as you're racking out the uh, okay. the focus. It'll extend out so that, you know, and then it kind of folds back That in. was part of the original? Yeah, I, yeah. that's what's great about these, uh, these old cameras. The details and the things that they do are... Yes. You know, often uh, Jeffrey and I will look at something and we'll get caught up on the <laughs> the, the craftsmanship yeah, of, amazing, of, yeah. uh, of how they did that, you right. know, or, you know, that it was all made by hand, that they right. actually came up with that. Right. And, mm-hmm. and some modern cameras don't even work that well. So, and, you know, and interestingly, um, some of the, the early stereo cameras had these sort of pleated bellows type Mm-hmm. Um, septums in there, and they always flopped and got in the way. What's wonderful about it, which is why I like using this camera, it's a spring loaded, uh, just sheet of like bellows material that's never in the way. Huh. Um, this is the one, this is this the one that's on the little roller, yeah, it's on the, the little, roller. little roller yeah. that it, it rolls up just like, like a, like a, uh, like a, uh, like a blind, a blind. Right. You know, except like window blind. Yeah. yeah, you just see it, it kind of works vertically <laughs> as as you're racking and out the focus. I was going to ask this later, but have have you guys ever been stumped in the sense that you found something in a camera that you just didn't know its purpose? Oh, I or, have, sure. uh, uh, well, yeah, I think we've often come across things. It's like why you know why things some things are the way they are, and we and still can't figure them out. Or what did this particular lens go to? Because we can't figure out what camera it went to at one point. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, Eric, I just found. He just showed me before I came in for this for this interview um, a booklet, a Fulmer and Schwing booklet on professional darkroom apparatus. And I love old catalogs because you get to look through them and see what these things are. You find out. And and you know I was looking through it 
And there's these wonderful things. And Eric said, well, you know, there's a lot of things in there that we have that we don't know what they are. And now we know what they are. Yes. And I said, yeah, <laughs> that's what's wonderful about these old catalogs. And, you know, I never throw anything out because you never know when you're going to need it. You don't know what purpose. It could be repurposed. It could be used for something you want to do. And I think not knowing what something is, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's, you know, what is it? How and those adult, old catalogs are illustrated extremely well. Wonderful. They're beautiful. You know, so objects, you, know. <laughs> you just have to look at the pictures and, and you know, you know. You learn the whole Figure thing. That <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have a collection of lens catalog that probably have the largest in the world. I probably have several hundred of those because they're primary source material. They really teach us a great deal. Right. And you've used this in the... Oh, yeah, I use it all the time. Yeah. I mean, okay. all the cameras that are here um, are ones I specifically wanted to bring ones that you know Frank had worked on and helped and me he with. Uses. And he, he uses. He uses them. Yeah. And I use yeah. them. And yeah. then yeah. I break them and then I bring them back. Because they get <laughs> a lot of use. Uh, it's amazing. They hold up very well, but you know they are old. So you can say Jeffrey has a different camera in his hands every day. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about that? Uh, oh, that's a wonderful yeah. camera. Yeah. That's a camera that Frank helped me with um, in terms of the wet plate back. Um, but I'll describe it. It's, a, it's called a carte de visite camera. So it takes a five by seven plate and it has four, four lenses. Um, and it was designed originally, um, it was used primarily in the you know, late 50th, uh, 1860s Civil War period. Abraham Lincoln would have been photographed with a camera like this. I think this is a, uh, either an American optical or a Scoville. There were a lot of companies that made them. The idea behind this was to make a, either a tintype or a glass plate negative that can then be uh, four images of the same subject and then, then can be printed as a uh, carte de visite, which were types of cards. Carte de visite is a visiting card. Originally they were calling cards, but that format, um, I forget the exact size of it, two and, two and a half inches by whatever, three and a quarter, four inches, something like that. Um, you can print four images at a time. And they were like the calling, they were like the, the, the celebrity of the baseball card mm -hmm. of the period. So you can take the glass negative and print them on album and paper, and then you would have the name of the person. Um, it was the first sort of celebrity photography. Right. So right. Abraham Lincoln was photographed like Civil War uh, and many others. So what I did was I modified uh, the camera. I made these four little um, doors on the front so that I can do four ex different exposures at one time. So I can shoot four images. Um, interestingly, the, the two side by side images give you a stereo image, but um, I set it up so that I can do four separate images or four separate exposures, and we make something called animated GIFs. Okay. So oh, you would have to talk yeah. about this. And yeah. if you go to it's like, a, yeah. yeah, like a mo you know, like a modern day uh, photo booth. Right. <laughs> right. It's very right. Moy Bridgian, I guess. It's, yeah. a, it's like a photo booth. <laughs> yeah, right. but how, how do you open these? So they just by close. Hand? Yeah, by just hand. Just yeah. by hand. Yeah, yeah. One at a time. And close. Yeah. One so because yeah. it's you know the, the the sensitivity is so slow that you can just you know close it, do another pose, you know, open the next one, and then you know the the on on the table back there is a nine lens, and I used that recently. Um, to make an animated GIF of a dancer uh, in tintype, so that uh, she did a, um, a particular choreographed piece in nine uh, images, and I shot each particular um, he has them image. Yeah, in each cap. Each cap, so I take it out. I think I even wrote the number on them. Got to yeah, remember right. the sequence. Um, I think some of those animated GIFs, if you go to Penumbra Foundation at Penumbra Foundation or at Penumbra Tintype Studio, that Instagram, you can see some of those animated GIFs, and there might be one on mine as well. And so the lenses were individual lenses that you had, you had, and you put them into this formation of nine no, or four. I mean, it, or no, they, it, the way um, it they came. These were that's the, those nine lenses was a gem camera, so you would make nine images. So say for a tintype, if everybody in the family wanted a picture of grandma, you know, and, you know, say there were several siblings and several, they all had photo album back then. That's how they, um, they kept their images, and even now. But, I mean, back then the photo album was really um, the way people kept their images and was the media of the day was the, the photo album. Um, everybody wanted a picture of grandma. So that would make nine at one time. They would cut them up with tin snips. Okay. Or they would make glass naked and they would print them. Uh, or sometimes mourning pins. Sometimes if you had somebody who passed away, they would make these little tintype mourning pins, and everybody would get a pin, and you can make nine. So it's a sort of mass production. Um, the wonderful thing about this camera is that it really allows me to sort of use modern digital technology when we make the animated GIF, and it's a lot of fun to do. So the, the lenses... Uh, for the most part, have to come as a set because they were a match set. So the manufacturer, um, when they, these were all hand ground, so they would probably um, have in front of them, whoever assembled them on the assembly line, you know, hundreds of these lenses, and they would have to put each lens into its bank um, and then check the focus to make sure that they were all focusing in the same place because the only focus was in the camera. The lenses themselves weren't focusing.
So they all had to be seated properly. They had to be seated right. properly yeah. and, and focused properly. And, you know, Frank and I actually went through that. We had a set that um, oftentimes either they lose elements and people replace them or one of the tubes goes missing. We try to put another one and they never quite match. So it's ideal if you can find a set that's in good condition, that hasn't been modified, um, and we're... Um, and were collimated by the factory at the time. And these are, these two sets are the only two that I have that are actually, and then you have to use them correctly, you have to level it, and you can't have it tilted. So the, all the, and then the lighting, especially in the studio, is very important because even if you're off by a little bit, um, the exposure on one will be different than the other. But even, in, uh, but even back in the day, they had exposure issues because they weren't all exactly ground the same, they didn't render the light. And I was looking at some old stereo um, images recently, and this, the, the exposures are always off between one and the other. It was really? driving me crazy that mine were <laughs> off and I, I was trying to get the exposures right. And then I went back and looked at old stereo cards and I realized they didn't get it either. So that was, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, part of the, you know, part of the charm, I guess, the, the problem with it. So when I decided to do this, um, I had a wet plate back and somebody had, you know, made an insert for it, but it wasn't focusing correctly. And somebody made it out of an old lens board, I think. So I brought it to Frank and he said, oh, well, the ground glass is not collimated to the, you know, to the wet plate back. So um, Frank... I was telling him that for weeks. He wouldn't listen to me, though. I'm glad you <laughs> finally got through to him. You find and the problem, what, then he, he built the inside. He built, he, he made a new um, a plate holder that fit into the, you know, a new, I guess it... I guess it's a, what would you call it? It's a, an insert that mm -hmm. goes into the wet plate right. back that was collimated. He had a depth. Um, I think I had the depth... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called the depth gauge right. that of course I bought a long time ago for something else and he said I need a depth gauge I said oh I have one and I went back <laughs> and there it was hmm. and he was able to um, match up where the the plate fell inside the holder to the ground glass and that made the whole camera uh, functional are there any companies uh, how many companies are still left making bellows well, that's always the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, there are not that many people make our manufacturers. There's still the... Uh, the custom bellows. Custom bellows in, in, in England, right? Yeah. And uh, there, is a, there is, I found a, uh, a U.S. bellows manufacturer makes ex uh, bellows extremely well. Custom makes them. It's not cheap, though. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they work really well for a lot of these old cameras. Because this um, is critical because your bellows are integral to a lot yeah, of these Yeah, it, it depends on the size. It, it usually takes a good month to get them, uh, for them to manufacture them. I, I'll send them the size, uh, the sizes. Uh, a camera this size, you're looking at an easy, easy $400 for, sure. or $450 for the bellows to be made. And then, of course, then a lot of times I will have to transfer the bellows or install the bellows onto either uh, remake frames for them. So it either depends on the camera. They have to be mounted on there certain different ways. Uh, each camera is a little bit different. But I either have to tra you know, salvage the, the frames of the old bellows and, and repair them or sometimes make a whole new frame and, and then inst install those bellows and then onto the camera itself. What would you recommend if somebody has an older camera that they're using and it's not unusual to have little pinholes at the very corners where they fold? For a fast repair, what would you recommend just as a, something to get you through the day? Uh, gaffer's tape. That is the best. That works wonders, you know, just yep. like in any, any situation on set. Um, you know, the, you know, you can get away with gaffer tapes for a good while. The only problem with it is if you just, if you leave it on there too long, the glue will dry out and it will stick, as you know, when you oh, gaffer yeah. tape, you know, and then a lot of cleanup has to do. And don't it use could, electrical it could, tape. It can also, it can also pull, uh, pull any moisture out of leather bellows, uh, the vintage ah, bellows, okay. and which can cause them to crack and get, uh, get worse. So if you do have to do, I, I always say, re I recommend it in a pinch, do it, but don't leave it on there. Uh, if you do have, generally do get uh, pinholes on all the corners of the bellows, especially cameras of this uh, vintage. Um, if they're, uh, the only uh, issue with bellows, with patching bellows, um, you would want to do the whole length of the, the bellows mm -hmm. with a, a strip of, of fabric that's light, light tight. It's like rubberized, yeah, rubberized yeah. fabric. You know, like yellow you know, material. That's, that's if, if that's the rest yeah. of the, you know, bellows are in good shape. You can get away with that. Now, you can't necessarily do that with some of the uh, cameras that fold up or close up like a deer door. Oh, yeah. Because uh, uh, those, uh, it, you know, if you put two in, the, it, the, you won't be able to close them up. Yeah, compression. And Yeah, the compression of the, of the bellows. So, uh, that will become an issue there. So the, that has to be dealt with in different ways. 
in that sense. But what, the last, you could always just, if worse comes to worse, you could always, something I used to do on occasion, I had one bellows that was problematic. When I was ready to go, I just used to take my dark cloth, drape it over yeah. the bellows. Well, and I, that, well that was the whole purpose. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. people forget about that. The reason why they had that big in those days is, is nothing, you know, they were all wooden, you know, the wood expands, it it, it, tight, it closes. So you're going to get cracks and space here and there. And even in, uh, back then, they were going to get, uh, you know, light leaks or pinholes in their bellows. Often, if you look at a lot of the old vintage photos, you see the photographer with the with the, that over their head, but all the way to the front of the camera. Uh-huh, right. yeah. From the front all the way back and over their back. Actually put clips on the front standard to exactly. hold it in place. And, sure. and, and, that's, and that was the whole purpose, just to keep any of that, because nothing was perfect then, you know, you, could, you can't. Well, you, can, you know, nothing is perfect now. I may tell people that if you get a brand new camera, there are these new Intrepid cameras, which are quite nice. They're, they're an expensive, you know, four by five, they just came out with an eight by 10. Um, and a new Shamanix camera. Shamanix makes magnificent cameras, um, which I love. But, you know, any new camera you should take out and check for pinholes because when they manufacture them, they're not perfect or mm-hmm. check for light leaks. Mm-hmm. Um, what about uh, modern lenses? Do you have any reason to put a modern lens on an older camera? When I say modern, I mean... Modern is the relative term yeah. for, for, for view cameras. Um, I, I don't know how many, you know, a lot of... I mean, when I, for me, a modern lens would be like a Schneider or a Simar or... Something like that. I, there are lenses that I like that are relatively modern. There's a Zenitar uh, 2.8 or 150, which is a large format 4x5 lens, a speed lens. Um, um, you know, they for film, they're wonderful. Um, and when you're shooting, you know, larger format, you're getting high resolution because of the size of the negative to begin with. Um, and if you're shooting color, if you're shooting color, you need a coated lens. And if you want a particular look, if you want a very modern look, you want a multi-coated lens. If you want something with a little more flair, a little more edge, then you want a single coated lens. Um, a Kodak um, commercial Ektar, the magnificent lens, both for black and white uh, and color with the lens that Avedon used. If you're using wet plate, which is a kind of a contrasty, um, if, if done a certain way, especially with strobe, you don't want a coated lens at all. Right. So, I mean, that comes into play. And I think with modern lenses, um, the, the more modern, you know, the more clinical they are. So if you want, you know, funk, if you want bokeh, if you want, you know, the out of focus they are to give a certain, if you want a curved field, if you want these different kinds of looks, the more modern they are, um, the more um, correct, corrected they are. Um, and for me, the, the more boring they, yeah. they, they are. <laughs> well, exactly. Franklin, other than what Jeff requests of you, what what are your common requests? And, and do you, will you Franken camera a 35 millimeter film camera? With some other, I haven't had many requests for thirty-five millimeter. It's, it's usually this medium to large format okay. stuff that I get requests. Um, yeah, uh, the only ones that are uh, that I get a little similar are, are modifying the the super D's and putting the uh, the graph lock backs on them so they have that versatility and in putting in sync and stuff. But when it comes to any of this stuff. Um, a lot of it is a, a case by case basis and individual uh, uh, vision and what yeah. they're trying to accomplish. Anything that uh, I mean is just sticking in your craw. Something that you you want to make work that hasn't worked yet, or you think it will work if you keep put more time into it. Uh, well, I'm working on you know one of the things this camera that I love that um, I think Frank has one of them. Maybe I took it back and remember the the Maki Flex. You know, I love that's those, your most recent my project. Most recent, I think. Um, that and also the SL66, the uh, the Roloflex SL66, which is basically a Hasselblad on steroids, because it has bellows, it has um, you know, front movements, um, and uh, you flip the lenses around. And yeah, and oftentimes, you know, I think I want to do. Yeah, I want to do. You can flip the lens, the, the lenses around, so you can do this wonderful macro. And a lot of times, I, I you know, I, I want Frank to do something, but he's so busy, and I feel guilty, like you know, pulling him aside <laughs> to do it. Um, that you know, I, I modified the uh, the roll effect SL sixty six with a universal iris, and instead of like finding the machine screws and tapping them, which I, I guess I could have done and everything, I just took some Velcro and I just slapped it on there, uh, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. And then with the um, the Maki Flex. Um, you know, I wanted to have a, I, I put a universal iris on that. I put a universal iris on everything because you can swap out lenses. But I wanted a chimney hood for mm-hmm. it. Um, they're very hard to find for the camera. So the Maki Flex is a plow bell. It's a nine by nine centimeter. And I love square. Um, this is a wonderful, beautiful format. Um, but it's really perfect for Instagram. You know? uh, uh-huh. And I don't like to crop. I'm not a cropper. Um, <laughs> some people like to crop. Nothing wrong with that. But um, I like a pure format. It's the beautiful round corners. Where do you look for 
gear for pieces, accessories? Is there a, a you know, maybe you don't want to give up sources, but is there any, well, uh, I mean, eBay may be pretty much, like you said, eBay fished, is probably the, cr- the best place, but you know, eBay is kind of drying up. I, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff is drying up. Um, you know, I look at flea markets, I go to antique shows, um, um, you know, people sometimes just contact me. I have stuff I want to get estate rid of. Sales. You know, estate, estate sales. sales. I would imagine um, you're you're known very you're very well known at this point for a lot of this eclectic photographic stuff. And I, yeah, I was just saying, I imagine a lot of people do contact you. Oh yeah, well they do. Sure. You know, I don't like selling stuff. I mean, you know, because you know, at this point, if you sell it, it's not replaceable. But I do advise. I, I look. I, I love the idea. I mean, I run a nonprofit organization, educational organization, arts and education, and I want people to make images. So if I don't have something or if I don't have a duplicate, I, you know, I say, well, you don't need to spend a lot of money. I tell them what to do. I help them. You know, I send them to Frank if they want to modify a camera. Do we have any any left over there? Any? Well, this is the. Uh, yeah, this, this is, is just a smaller version of a, a Super D, and what it, this has is uh, a Polaroid back. A Polaroid modification. Uh, yeah. to okay. Take a pack. Is there? Can you still get pack film for this now, or no? Uh, it's gone, isn't it? They don't make it anymore. And, I, and I've, I've been talking to Frank about modifying some of these um, uh, Fuji Instax uh, cameras, mm-hmm. you know, so that we can get. And some people are already doing it. There's a couple of people that are, you know, charging. They charge a lot of money, six hundred bucks for a for an Instax back. Um, but oh, so you know, to shoot Instax film on these old cameras. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, so, you know, we talk about that, you know, it's the time factor and Frank can do it. It's just a matter of he has to get repairs done. And I totally understand that. The other thing that I'm looking into, and, you know, Eric was the one that brought this up is this, this Canon selfie printer. Mm-hmm. You know, if you use it with your Sony Alpha with a funky lens and you can walk around with this little printer, then you can make these really nice images with a funky lens. So you're giving us something that's more interesting than just sort of a clinical digital picture. Um, Wait a minute, is this printer battery operated? It is, yeah. Oh, okay. And it's yeah, Wi Fi yeah. as well, it's right? Wi-Fi. It's I think so it's Wi Fi. You put send... the chip in, you can take the chip out of your camera, you can print it right there. Yeah. So that opens up That's a whole. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, sort of yeah. a photo booth sort of thing. The new Polaroid. <laughs> yeah, the new Polaroid. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this lens here it was something that was added? Uh... Yes, yeah, so that lens. Um, was added to the camera on the front of the standard because it was too lar- too long and too big to go inside the bay of the camera. So I modified the front standard so that I could put that camera, put that lens on that camera, um, and then Frank modified the Polaroid back so that it would fit into the um, into the back of the camera. Uh, and that that has been a workhorse, you know, that camera, you know. And I, I just want to point out, you know, when Frank built something. You know, it is it is built to last. It is you know thought out. He takes it. He's one of the most patient people. What's up with me? So he's one of the most patient <laughs> people I've, I've ever met. And even like, he's like, it's funny. Like he's in the middle. Of, like he can multitask. He's in the middle of, like screwing it, looking for a tiny little screw. And I'll come up to him and he'll, and in the most patient way, he's like, yeah, you do this and whatever. And then he goes back to what he's doing. And you know, <laughs> and Frank, there's a question for you. We're talking about uh, the, how meticulous you are and careful, which you have to be for this. You're dealing with a lot of cameras where we are dealing with wood that's over a century old and it become very, very tricky to work with. Do you take extra precautions before you start drilling or tapping or modifying a lot of these wood surfaces or any well, of these I, other I materials? Always, I always check my measurements and, and you know, double check, triple check things and stuff because, you know, it, it's uh, they can easily crack yeah. and, and things like that. They're, it's dried out wood. Um, but uh, again, the wood was was uh, uh, it was uh, kiln dried very well back then, and, and you know, unlike a lot of the wood that comes as you get uh, today, so it's it's held up very well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, these are most of these cameras are made of good quality uh, woods. Uh, a lot of them are, believe it or not, mahogany underneath that leather. They're, they're fine. Honduran mahogany. Yeah, so you know it's beautiful wood under there. If you've ever seen one of these totally stripped down, oh, they're, just, they're gorgeous. Just yeah. you know, you know just it's almost a shame original. to cover them up again. Yeah, you know <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, I do take care. Uh, uh, every one of them is different. So whenever I do a modification of putting a graph lock back on there or making a uh, modifying a Polaroid back to fit on there. I often uh, request that the, if the customer can have the camera, bring in the camera and leave it with me. Mm-hmm. So I get that exact fit for that particular camera. 
that way to prevent any light leaks or anything like that because there are, you know, like we, we discussed I, I would before, think that's the mandatory difference. to have that camera with you. I, I, I usually request yeah. or ask, ask for that. You know, there are other times that they don't want to give it up because, of course, they want to be t- making images. You know, I just, uh, the modif- there, was a, there was a repair that Frank did. I just want to mention because it just shows how meticulous he is. Um, and I, I don't know if I should mention the photographer. I mean, Frank can if he wants to. But um, there's, a, there's a thing called a bag mag, which is a, a magazine that holds, um, I think, something like 12 plates for um, for film, it was a uh, rapid. You can it wasn't quite rapid fire, but there was something called a graphmatic holder. But this is the pre graphmatic. Oh, for, this was for Paul. You're talking yeah, about? for Paul. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's it's a magazine that you can put on the back of a graphlex that holds twelve sheets of film, and then you would shoot it, and then you would pull this rod, and it would pull out that sheet into the bag, and then it would then you would replace it in the back, so that you can you know. Um, in succession shoot, instead of carrying all these film holders, you just have all the film. In fact, I used one of those when I shot at Yankee Stadium opening day 2016. I bought the... Um, Big the, Bertha? The Big Bertha. Right. <laughs> and I shot that. And what happened was during the rapid, I actually tore some of the bags. They were so old. You know, I got some wonderful light leaks. Wonderful the, the leather was pretty <laughs> much, leather was pretty dry much, rot pretty kind much of thing, dead. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so Frank got in for repair um, to remake the bag mags. And not only did he, you know, re he cut out... The leather perfectly made the template. He even made the liner. These had a, a cloth liner to prevent any other light leaking. And um, I, I couldn't believe how magnificent and beautiful that uh, that bag mag was when, <laughs> when he was done with it. Did it, it you know, almost exactly the way they would have done it in the factory, you know. That was the first time I attempted that project of restoring the, uh, the leather pouch on those... Uh, Magazines. Is that part of the uh, the thrill, the challenge? Someone just well, can't do yeah, something. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I I get a lot of thrill out of that. You yeah. know, I, sure. you know, it's a challenge for me. And, and you know, uh, even I have uh, cameras down there that uh, people have given up already. I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they say, yeah. I said, no, I still have your camera here. I'm. I still check, do it every now and then, and then yeah. see what I can do. Because I, yeah. I I I'm just a believer in that eventually yeah. I will and. Uh, I've many times I've had a lot of success. Uh, there's a lot of times that you know I did have to give up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can go on all day here. Uh, well, For sure, right? I know, and um, actually, I think we'd all like to do that, but uh, we do have limitations. Uh, Jeff, um, first of all, thanks guys for hosting us here today. It's terrific. If uh, people want to, if our listeners want to learn more about the Penumbra Foundation and the Center of Alternative Photography, what should they be doing? My uh, website is. Really good place to go, um, penumbrafoundation.org. So mm-hmm. we're a nonprofit photographic arts and education. We teach workshop, workshops in uh, original and historical photographic processes. Um, we have a lecture series. We actually have a lecture coming up tonight. Um, Vito Worms, I don't know, this is probably not going to air in time. But the website is a good place. We have um, all kinds of events here. We have a membership program. It's a wonderful way to support us. We support artists who are working in these processes. It's a great facility here, too. It's yeah. um, really, really mind-boggling. Yeah, I just want to point, you know, I know Frank for 15 years. He was at London Repro, and when they closed up, you know, um, I, I was... Uh, found out you know that Frank didn't know where Frank was going to end up um, and I recruited him I said come here and I'm very happy that he did because he really adds to the overall organization as another element um, of the organization a piece of the puzzle but you, so puzzle. you you basically have your own business that's just housed here that's the uh, idea correct and, and yeah, what's your I, info for it, that well it, it, cameradoctornyc.com we have a website and of course uh, uh, through the Penumbra Foundation as well they they got us in their on their website we have a uh, um, Instagram uh, camera doctor NYC too, so you know Facebook, yeah. uh, and you know and we we try we we may deal with this old school stuff, but we try to keep up with the, uh, <laughs> the yeah. I just also, yeah, I just also wanted to point out that you know this place has been here for fifteen years and it just started as workshops, but now we have studio spaces, uh, highlight studios, which was was run um, separately is now part of Penumbra. So we have commercial studio spaces with the full complement of digital and pro photo that are part of Penumbra and the proceeds go to our organization. There's a photo lab next door, LTI light side. So you have, you know, photo lab, camera repair. LTI is my lab. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. My film. Um, there's um, one you know, stop shopping. One mm-hmm. We have lecture series, residency program, tin type studio, all on, you know, this little spot, 36 East. 30th Street, and you know it's really been a wonderful journey it's uh, developing yeah. um, this organization. And we thank you know we thank you, we thank B and H, we thank you know Alan and John and Jason for for doing this because I think it's wonderful to get the word out on wonderful work. And, and you guys. we enjoy doing it. 
If you are not a subscriber, pull over to the side of the road right now, drop whatever you're doing, and head on over to iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, SoundCloud, or YouTube, and sign up for instant access to every show we do, along with access to over 100 past episodes. And while you're there, leave a comment. Ask us something you've been dying to ask us but have been too bashful to ask, or simply say hi. We'll keep an eye out for your messages. On behalf of Jeff Berliner of the Penumbra Foundation, Frank Rubio, the camera doctor, Jason Tables, John Harris, and myself, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>